8 Creepiest Unsolved Mysteries, You Have to See to Believe. As a kid Unsolved Mysteries was more terrifying to me, than any horror movie I had ever seen. What truly made the show chilling was that all of the featured stories were true, and many dangerous suspects remained at large. Running from 1987 to 2010, the series focused on missing persons cases, unsolved murders and unexplained paranormal phenomena. The show changed hosts throughout the years, but it was the late Robert Stack, who made the series what it was in the late 80s, and early 90s. Stack's undeniably creepy presence and haunting voice set the mood, and helped to create a sense of uneasiness before the stories were even told. The distinct, eerie theme music would hit as a dark scenario was reenacted for the audience, and suddenly the viewer was no longer safe in their own home. The show helped create an atmosphere where everything seemed to be playing out in real time, and it created an overwhelming sense of dread that could drown you in your living room. The following are the creepiest cases to appear on the show. 1. Connecticut River Valley Serial Killer Mystery The Connecticut River Valley Killer refers to an unidentified serial killer, believed responsible for a series of similar knife murders, mostly in and around Claremont, New Hampshire, and the Connecticut River Valley primarily in the 1980s. In the mid-1980s, three young women disappeared from the Claremont area. In 1985 and 1986, the skeletal remains of two of the vanished women were recovered, within about a thousand feet of each other in a wooded area in Kellyville, New Hampshire. The condition of the remains made the cause of death difficult to determine, but certain factors pointed to multiple stab wounds. Between the recovery of the first and second bodies, a 36-year-old woman was stabbed to death in a frenzied attack inside her home in Saxton's River, Vermont. Ten days later, the remains of the third missing woman were found, post-mortem examination revealed evidence of multiple stab wounds. At this point, investigators began examining prior homicides in the area, and found two previous cases, in 1978 and 1981, that further reinforced the presence of a burgeoning serial killer. At the peak of the investigation, and after additional homicides and one non-fatal attack, investigators noted similarities in MO, off-use dump sites, and specific wound patterns that linked many of the murders, suggesting a common perpetrator. Seven homicides are commonly cited as being conclusively linked to the Connecticut River Valley Killer. On October 24, 1978, 27-year-old Kathy Milligan, born May 25, 1951, was photographing birds at the Chandler Brook Wetland Preserve in New London, New Hampshire. The next day, her body, with at least 29 stab wounds, was found yards away from where she was last seen. On July 25, 1981, 37-year-old University of Vermont student Mary Elizabeth Critchley disappeared while hitchhiking. She was last spotted near Interstate 91 at the Massachusetts, Vermont border, as she had been hitchhiking to Waterbury, Vermont where she lived with a friend. On August 9, 1981, her body was found in a wooded area off Unity Stage Road in Unity, New Hampshire. Owing to the condition of the body, the medical examiner was unable to determine a cause of death. 16-year-old nurse's aide Bernice Courtmanch was last seen by her boyfriend's mother in Claremont on May 30, 1984. She was thought to have set out to see her boyfriend in Newport by hitchhiking along Route 12. She did not reach her destination, and was subsequently reported missing. Two months later, on July 20, 1984, 27-year-old Ellen Fried, supervising nurse at Valley Regional Hospital, made a late-night stop to use a payphone outside Leo's Market in Claremont. Fried spoke with her sister for approximately an hour, when she suddenly remarked on a strange car she'd observed driving back and forth in the vicinity. She stepped away from the phone briefly to make sure her car's engine would start and then returned. After speaking for a few minutes longer, Fried concluded the call. The next day, Fried failed to report to work, and her car was found abandoned on Jarvis Road, a few miles away from Leo's Market. On July 10, 1985, 27-year-old single mother Eva Morse, born May 6, 1958, was seen hitchhiking near the border of Claremont and Charlestown, New Hampshire, en route 12. This is the last time anyone would see Morse alive, and she too was reported missing. On September 19, 1985, the remains of Ellen Fried were found in a wooded area, near the banks of the Sugar River in Kellyville, New Hampshire. 
post-mortem examination revealed evidence of multiple stab wounds, and probable sexual assault. During the afternoon of April 15, 1986, 36-year-old Linda Moore, born April 20, 1949, was doing yard work outside her home in Saxton's River, Vermont, a short distance from I-91. That evening, her husband returned home to find his wife's dead body, bearing multiple stab wounds. The crime scene suggested a fierce struggle had taken place. Numerous witnesses reported having seen a slightly stocky, dark-haired man with a blue knapsack lingering near Moore's home the day of the murder. The man was thought to be between 20 and 25 years old, clean-shaven, with a somewhat round face, and wearing dark-rimmed glasses. The following year, a composite sketch was released. Four days after Moore's murder, a fisherman happened upon the remains of Bernice Courtmange, about 1,000 yards from where Ellen Fried's remains had been recovered. Forensic examination uncovered evidence of knife wounds to the neck and an injury to the head. Six days later, the remains of Eva Morse were found by loggers, about 500 feet from where Mary Elizabeth Critchley's body had been discovered in 1981. Postmortem examination found evidence of knife wounds to Morse's neck. On January 10, 1987, 38-year-old nurse Barbara Agnew was returning from a skiing outing with friends in Stratton, Vermont. That evening, a snowplow driver encountered her green BMW at a northbound I-91 rest stop in Hartford, Vermont. The door was cracked and there was blood on the steering wheel. On March 28, 1987, Agnew's body was found near an apple tree in Heartland. She had been stabbed to death. There was a heavy snowstorm in the area during the night of Agnew's disappearance, and she was a mere 10 miles from her home. Her reasons for pulling into the rest stop have been puzzling to investigators. The killings remained unsolved and had apparently stopped when, late in the evening on August 6, 1988, 22-year-old Jane Borowski, seven months pregnant, was returning from a county fair in Keene, New Hampshire, when she stopped at a closed convenience store in West Swansea, to purchase cola from a vending machine. Borowski returned to her car and began drinking the beverage, when she took notice of a jeep wagoneer parked next to her. Via her rear-view mirror, Borowski then saw the driver of the vehicle walking around the back of her vehicle. He then approached her open window, and asked her if the payphone was working, at which time he immediately grabbed her, and pulled her from the vehicle. Borowski struggled, and the man accused her of beating up his girlfriend, and asked if she had Massachusetts plates on her car. Borowski responded that she had New Hampshire plates, but this did not deter her attacker who proceeded to stab her 27 times before driving away and leaving her to die. Borowski managed to return to her car, and drive on Route 32 toward a friend's house for help. As she neared the house, she noticed a vehicle driving in front of her, and realized that it was her attacker. Borowski finally reached her friend's home at which the occupants immediately came to her aid. Her attacker apparently performed a U-turn, and slowly passed by the house as Borowski was tended to before speeding away into the night. Borowski was treated at the hospital, where it was determined that the attack had resulted in a severed jugular vein, two collapsed lungs, a kidney laceration, and severed tendons in her knees and thumb. Fortunately, Borowski's baby survived, although not without complications, Borowski's daughter would later be diagnosed with mild cerebral palsy. Borowski was able to provide authorities with a composite sketch, and the first three characters of the attacker's license plate. In addition, there were some suspects that were investigated in the case, but there was no official arrest made in terms of announcing the real identity of the River Valley serial killer by local authorities. Even today, the case of the Connecticut River Valley serial killer was still unsolved. 2. The Disappearance of Angela Marie Hammond Imagine hearing something happen on the other end of your phone call, and being totally hopeless in the situation. On April 4, 1991, pregnant Angela Hammond stopped to use a payphone at a convenience store parking lot. She was on the phone with her fiancé, Rob Schaffer, when a strange man in a pickup truck began circling the lot. She told her boyfriend, that the man had made his way next to the payphone with a flashlight, as though he were looking for something. Then. Schaffer heard his girlfriend screams through the phone, before the line went dead. Schaffer rushed to the convenience store, and as a truck drove past him he heard Andrea screaming his name. He followed the vehicle, but his transmission failed and his car stopped working. 
Andrea and the man in the pickup truck have never been found, and no one has been charged in her disappearance. Angela's disappearance is similar to the abduction of Elaine Nix in Georgia in 1999. Like Elaine, 20-year-old Angela Marie Hammond was speaking to her boyfriend, Rob, at a payphone at approximately 11.15 p.m. on April 4, 1991 in Clinton, Mo. The payphone she was using was in the parking lot of the food barn store, located at Jefferson and 2nd Street, and just seven blocks from Rob's house. During the conversation, she told Rob that a man pulled up next to her car. He was driving an older model two-tone, late 1930s green Ford truck with a water, or fish seen in the back window. She described the man as being filthy with a beard and mustache, glasses, and wearing overalls. The man got out and looked around his truck with a flashlight. One report said Rob told Angie to ask him if he needed to use the phone to which he responded that he did not. Moments later, Angela let out a big scream. Rob dropped the phone and immediately headed to where Angela called him from. As he reached the site, he saw the truck she described and heard Angela scream, Rob. The truck sped away and Rob followed it. However, his transmission gave out and he was forced to stop after a couple miles. Two witnesses reported seeing this same man and his truck near the telephone booth Angela was using. Angela's car was later found abandoned in the parking lot. Police extensively interviewed Rob and he was ruled out as a suspect. Angela and her kidnapper have never been found. Angela was four months pregnant at the time of her abduction. Some believe that confessed serial killer, Larry DeWayne Hall, abducted and murdered Angela. Police believe he may be responsible for up to four murders and disappearances across the country. Hall traveled extensively with the Civil War reenactment group. He was convicted of the murder of Lori Dippies in Wisconsin in 1992. He was convicted of the 1993 federal kidnapping of 15-year-old Jessica Roach of Georgetown, Illinois. Another serial killer, Kenneth McDuff, has also been named as being a possible suspect in Angela's kidnapping. In 1990, McDuff was released from prison where he served time for a triple homicide in 1966. He was convicted again in 1992 and sentenced to death for additional murders in Texas. He was executed in 1998. It is unclear if McDuff was in Missouri at the time of Angela's abduction. Police believe Angela's case may be related to that of 30-year-old Cheryl Ann Kinney, a convenience store worker who disappeared on February 27, 1991 from Nevada, Mo, and Trudy Darby who was abducted at gunpoint from a convenience store in Max Creek, Mo on January 19, 1991. She was later found murdered. Two men were convicted of that crime. Cheryl has never been found nor has anyone been arrested in connection to her kidnapping. There is no evidence linking the three cases. On May 18, 1991 in Brooklyn, NY, the remains of a woman were found in an open grassy area off Seaview Avenue, 200 feet west of Fountain Avenue near Belt Parkway. The woman was about 5 feet 0 inches to 5 feet 2 inches and weighed about 139 pounds. She had long, brown straight hair. The woman was pregnant and had died weeks prior. Cause of death is unknown. Angela was 4 apostrophe 11 5 feet 0 inches tall and weighed between 120 and 140 pounds. She was also pregnant at the time she went missing. Could this be Angela? Maybe her killer was a trucker and traveled all over the states. We have no idea when nor if Angela was murdered. I believe she was killed, but there is no way of telling when this occurred. Her killer could have kept her alive for a few days before killing her. The only difference from this victim and Angela is Angela's hair was curly, not straight. But, you never know. 3. Beverly McGowan, Chameleon Killer. Elaine Parent, an elusive American con woman nicknamed the Chameleon Killer by police who pursued her during a 12-year manhunt in America and Britain, has shot herself dead in Florida as officers waited to arrest her. Flamboyant to the last, Parent shot herself in the heart, with a 357 Magnum as officers stood outside her bedroom door, ostensibly to allow her to get dressed. To their frustration, Parent's suicide two weeks ago means that she has taken the secrets of her bizarre and murderous criminal career to the grave. Scotland Yard were among the forces keen to question Parent, 60, an American citizen who used to live in London and often pretended to be English, about the killing of her former flatmate, Beverly McGowan, 34, a bank clerk in Florida. 
because Parent used many aliases, however, American investigators fear that McGowan was not her only murder victim. Her speciality, they believe, was stalking single women, killing them and stealing their identities. She was born in the Bronx in 1942, but in the mid to late 1990s spent five years on the run in Britain. Here, Parent apparently perfected a refined English accent, went into hiding with a former lesbian lover, a female businesswoman, and enjoyed baiting detectives back in Florida. In 1998 she sent them a photograph of an oil painting of herself, with the phrase best wishes, your chameleon typed neatly on the back. The Florida press gave her another sobriquet, the world's most wanted woman. Nora Pfeiffer, the dogged investigator for the Florida State Attorney's Office, who had trailed parents since McGowan's murder, said, this is the most difficult homicide I've ever handled. We've always been days, months, even years behind the killer. Our suspect is a mistress of disguise, and has more than 20 false identities, many of them stolen. I've had sightings of her in London, Paris, Turkey, Australia and South Africa. And 12 years after Beverly was murdered, I'm still no closer to knowing why. The police hunt for parent had begun in July 1990, after McGowan's mutilated, and decapitated corpse was discovered on a remote canal bank in southern Florida. Her head and hands had been hacked off with a chainsaw to delay identification. A distinctive tattoo of Thumper, the Disney rabbit, had also been crudely cut from her stomach. But the killer missed the tattoo of a flower on her ankle, and the police were able to identify the body as McGowan's. Police also discovered that in June 1990, the dead woman placed a flat share advertisement in the classified columns of the Sun Sentinel newspaper, share two halves condo, female 34 plus two cats, $290 plus half utilities. At some point between July 10th and 14th, Parent answered the advert, calling herself Alice and claiming to be an English employee of IBM on secondment to Florida, the charming con woman evidently impressed the younger woman. McGowan agreed to rent a room to Alice, who quickly won her flatmate's confidence. Alice claimed to be an expert in numerology, a pseudoscience that uses personal numbers to predict the future, and persuaded McGowan to hand over her social security, bank account and driving license numbers for analysis. It was a fatal move. Within 72 hours McGowan had been murdered and Parent adopted her identity. After spending a few hundred dollars on her victim's credit cards, she boarded flight BA-292 to London. At Heathrow, Parent rented a car from Avis, but was forced to use cash as the stolen credit card had been cancelled. The failed transaction raised suspicion, and Scotland Yard was soon on McGowan's trail. When news came through that the card's owner had been murdered, the investigation switched to Britain. Parent, however, disappeared. In London, Parent had a former lover, a female senior executive at a blue-chip company. Although detectives would not discover this for another five years, the couple had lived together for several of years until Parent's mood swings, and demands for money split them up. Parent had even tried to blackmail her lover. The wily Parent managed to persuade her former lover to take her in again. As the police searched in vain, their quarry was living comfortably in a smart house in southwest London. When the relationship foundered again, Parent's actions became more extraordinary. She kidnapped her former lover's dogs taking them to America and attempting to hold them to ransom. She also sent the woman death threats. Later, Parent was arrested in Miami Beach in possession of documents that showed her to have three separate identities. Remarkably, police failed to run her name through the computer and released her on bail. Subsequent investigations shows that she next surfaced in New Mexico, running a restaurant. A year later she was back in Florida, claiming to be South African and apparently penniless. In 1992, even as the Florida police sought her in connection with Beverly's murder, Parent, under another identity, filed a civil negligence suit against the state, after she slipped and injured herself in a restaurant. She won, though the police will not confirm how much she was awarded and damages. In 1994 she disappeared from view altogether. Relatively little is known about the real Elaine Antoinette Parent. Those who knew her, and in some cases lived with her, describe her variously as beautiful, intelligent, charming and bisexual, but also speak of her flip side, aggressive, prone to violent mood swings and threatening. The only child of an American father and a French-Canadian mother, she grew up in the Bronx in New York. 
By her 30th birthday she was in Florida, and three years later acquired her first conviction, for shoplifting. For most of her adult existence, however, Parent was a camera. Some of her 20 identities were stolen from women she met, and seduced but did not kill, some were entirely invented and some cannot be traced by detectives at all. Privately, they fear that these women could have met the same fate as Beverly McGowan. Dr. Barbara Kerwin is a leading forensic psychologist, who profiled Parent several months before her death. She is driven by her own psychological demons, she said in December last year. I believe she steals identities compulsively, to fill up the emptiness of her own personality. Dr. Kerwin also believed that Parent both feared and needed the police manhunt. The oil painting is very theatrical. I believe she sent it to law enforcement as a way of thumbing her nose at them, of sort of teasing them by saying, I'm alive, I'm well, look out for me but you'll never find me. A fortnight ago Ms. Pfeiffer received a tip-off, that her quarry was back in Florida under yet another assumed identity. She went to an apartment in Panama City in the state's panhandle. Parent made them wait outside her bedroom and, when one officer became suspicious and knocked on the door, she shot herself in the chest. 4. The Disappearance of Patricia Meehan Accidents are scary enough as it is, but what happened to Patricia Meehan, after a head-on collision is downright terrifying. It was late April 20, 1989, when Meehan's car hit another vehicle on a stretch of highway in Montana. The other driver explained to police that Meehan crawled out of her vehicle, stared over at her, and then climbed a fence to proceed into the woods. She has never been seen again. On April 20, 1989, on a dark country road near Circle, Montana, a woman driving on the wrong side of the road almost hit a car head-on. Another driver, Carol Heights, witnessed the near miss, and then was hit by the same car. Carol emerged from the wreckage dazed, but not seriously injured. Then a woman appeared out of the darkness. Carol realized it was the woman who hit her, she just stared. She never said anything, she just stared at me. I will never forget her. The driver of the first car, Peggy Buehler, returned to help and saw the silent woman. As I looked out across the accident, I noticed someone on the other side of the fence, standing there like a spectator, not like it had happened to her. The silent woman walked away from the accident scene, and vanished into the night. Police traced the car to its owner, 38-year-old Patricia Meehan, and began to search for her. Over the next five days, they looked on land and from the air, but found no trace of Patricia. There were two theories as to how Patricia left the area. She may have stowed away on a hay truck, that was seen about half a mile from the accident. Or, she simply hitched a ride. At least 100 people have reported seeing Patricia Meehan since she vanished. Patricia has made no attempt to contact her family or friends. Authorities believe she may be suffering from amnesia. Just before the accident, those who knew her well, including her mother, Dolly Meehan, noticed that Patricia seemed depressed and withdrawn. She was, I guess, taking in her own life. What had she accomplished? I think she missed having children, because I think she realized she really loved them. After Patricia disappeared, her family found a roll of undeveloped film still in her camera. It contained a haunting self-portrait. Psychologist Don LaPlante speculated on Patricia's mental health. It appears that Patricia was experiencing a very difficult time in her life, and was involved in a rather dramatic accident, which may have involved a head injury. The combination of these factors may have caused amnesia. She does not know who she is, has lost memories of the past, and is out searching for herself throughout the country. Patricia was spotted dozens of times between Montana and Seattle, mainly at truck stops. But in every case, she had hitchhiked out of the area by the time authorities arrived. Waitress Barbruff confirmed one sighting of Patricia in Bozeman, Montana, in May of 1989, just a few miles from her home. Patty came in the door and wanted to be sat quickly and served quickly. She told me, I'm in a hurry. And I said, well, we do breakfast in 10 minutes. You'll be out very quickly. And then I said to her, you must have to be back to work at 9? It was about 8.30. She said, no, I'm just going shopping. I couldn't understand why it was so important for her to be there right at 9 o'clock to go shopping. She was in such a huge hurry. Another waitress, Brenda Clements, also noticed that Patricia was acting strangely, 
what stood out in my mind was that she seemed really disorientated, and really spacey. I heard her talking to herself. She sat at that table for an hour and a half more just looking out the window, watching people walk by. That's when I walked up to her and asked her, you okay? I was wondering if there was anything I could do, because she seemed so lost. I felt like she didn't know where she was or who she was. Although years have passed with no word from Patricia, her father and the rest of her family still hold out hope that she may one day find her way home, more than anything else in the world. I want her back with us. And we would then know that she was safe. Not knowing who she is taking a ride from, that's my biggest worry. I just pray day in and day out that she's with some good people. Over the years there have been reported sightings of men in places like Washington, and all over the United States. Her family believes she suffered from psychological issues, or that she had amnesia from the accident, and has been hitchhiking across the country. 5. The Deaths of Don Henry and Kevin Ives In the pre-dawn hours of August 23, 1987, a 6,000-ton cargo train made its regular night run to Little Rock, Arkansas. The train was just over a mile long and was traveling at a speed of 52 miles per hour. The train had been riding smoothly as engineer Stephen Scheuer approached the small town of Bryant, Arkansas. Suddenly, he saw something in his path, but couldn't tell what it was. As the train drew closer, Scheuer made the horrifying discovery that two boys were lying motionless across the railroad tracks from the time that we had placed the train into an emergency position and laid down on the horn. I would estimate about three to five seconds to impact. And that may not sound like a very long period of time, but when you're bearing down a couple of children, it's an eternity, honestly. Despite the engineer's frantic emergency stop, the weight of the heavy cargo train carried it for a full half mile. The boys' bodies were terribly mangled. The two victims were identified as 16-year-old Don Henry and 17-year-old Kevin Ives, best friends and popular seniors at Bryant High School. The state medical examiner said the boys had been under the influence of marijuana, and he ruled the deaths accidental. Don and Kevin's parents, however, could not accept that ruling. Larry Ives began a crusade to find out what really happened, and to salvage the reputation of his son Kevin. Well I couldn't believe that Kevin was knocked out on marijuana, or into any kind of heavy drugs, anything like that, because I was at home a lot during the day. When Kevin come in from school and Linda was here at night, and we'd never seen him in a state, that he even act like he was you know spaced out, or however you want to phrase it. Kevin and Don were typical teenage boys. They loved to work on their cars. They loved to hunt. Don was a natural comedian and Kevin was his best audience. Most weekends, the two double dated with their girlfriends. However, on the night of Saturday, August 22, 1987, Kevin and Don met a group of friends at the commuter parking lot, a favorite gathering place for the local teenagers. Around midnight, the two boys left to go back to Don's house. Kevin waited on the porch while Don went inside to talk with his father, Curtis Henry, and he came in at approximately 12.15, and told me where he was going and everything. I told him just to be careful and he took one of my spotlights with him and took his point to two. The two boys set off to go spotlighting, a form of night hunting which is illegal in Arkansas. One of them would shine a light in the animal's eyes, transfixing the prey, while the other fired. That night, the boys chose their usual hunting ground, along the railroad tracks that ran behind Don's house. Three hours later, the train came speeding down Bryant Hill. The boys were lying exactly parallel on the tracks, their arms straight down by their sides. According to the train crew, they were partially covered by a light green tarp. Lying parallel to both of them was Don's .22 caliber rifle. According to Steven Schroyer, neither boy was moving, I started lying down on the diesel horn. And I got no reaction, none at all, not so much as a flinch. And we just passed over them. What had caused the two boys to lie side by side on the railroad tracks? The state medical examiner concluded. They had smoked the equivalent of 20 marijuana cigarettes. He determined that Kevin and Don had been in a deep sleep induced by the drug, and had never heard the oncoming train. He ruled their death an accident. Don and Kevin's parents would not accept the medical examiner's conclusion. Kevin's father Larry hired a private investigator to find out what really happened, every time he would try to find out something, 
It seemed like he would mean resistance from different authorities. And we weren't getting anywhere. Five months after their sons were killed, the boys' parents held a press conference. They hoped to force the authorities to reopen the investigation. The day after their press conference, the investigation was officially reopened. Newly appointed prosecutor Richard Garrett had the boys' bodies exhumed for a second autopsy. The doctor concluded that, together, the boys had smoked, not 20, but between one and three marijuana cigarettes. He also found evidence that one boy was already dead, and one unconscious, before the train ever hit them. A grand jury reversed the medical examiner's original finding of accidental death, and officially ruled the boys' deaths were probable homicides. Prosecutor Garrett then focused on the green tarp reported by the train crew. Neither boy owned one. Garrett wanted to know who had covered them with it, and why, all four of the people on the train who were able to observe, the scene prior to the accident, stated that the boys were partially covered by a green tarp. However, police who searched the scene later denied, that engineer Scheuer had even told them about the tarp. According to Scheuer, they even questioned the tarp's existence, that to me would be like questioning the existence of the boys on the track. Because what's real is real and what's not is not. And. It was there, as well as the boys. Then, another intriguing lead surfaced. One week before the boys were killed, a man wearing military fatigues was spotted near the train tracks. His behavior aroused suspicion. When police officer Danny Allen stopped to question him, the man opened fire, I got up from the seat. The subject was gone. We searched the area and never found the subject. On the same night Kevin and Don died, witnesses again reported seeing a man in military fatigues. This time he was heading down a road less than 200 yards, from the spot where the boys' bodies were found. Police, however, were unable to locate him. Don Henry's t-shirt was analyzed by an expert pathologist. Cuts in the fabric indicated that Don was stabbed before the train ran over him. In light of this new evidence, the grand jury changed its ruling, from probable homicide to definite homicide. 6. The Butcher of Kingsbury Run Between 1935 and 1938, a serial killer murdered and dismembered at least 12 victims, only two of which were ever positively identified. This killer is officially unidentified, yet researchers of today are quite certain, who committed these horrible crimes. During the 1930s Cleveland was a city on the rise. The population continued to grow, and became a melting pot of laborers needed to support, our economically powerful steel and manufacturing base. Millionaire's Row was in its heyday. The Great Lakes Exposition and the Republican National Convention were slated for 1936 as were many other conferences and conventions. Despite the effects of the Great Depression, people were beginning to get on their feet again. Against this backdrop of a large city improving economically, one of the most prolific and gruesome serial killers, of all time carried out his acts of horror, distracting the citizens of our city, from the pride and prosperity of the times. Thirteen people were brutally murdered over the course, of four years beginning in 1934 all of them decapitated most of them while they were still alive. Although safety director Elliot Ness claimed to have solved the crimes, no suspect was identified, and no one was brought to trial. The murders ended as abruptly as they had begun. To this day the Kingsbury Run murders remain one of the most sensational, and intriguing unsolved crimes in our nation's history. Kingsbury Run is a prehistoric riverbed running, from the flats to about East 90th Street, the train and rapid transit tracks still run through the run. Bordered on the north by Woodland Avenue, and on the south by Broadway Avenue, Kingsbury Run was a dark, dreary and dangerous place in the 1930s. The dispossessed of the Great Depression lived in appalling conditions. Trash and filth dominating the makeshift hobo jungle that occupied much of the run. These people, most of them transients, often rode the rails to escape the brutal Cleveland winters, or simply to keep moving. The area just to the east of the run was known as the Roaring Third, home to bars, brothels, fluff houses and gambling dens. In this grim setting, the most notorious murder case in Cleveland's history would begin to unfold. September 1934, a young man finds the lower half of a women's torso, thighs still attached, but amputated at the knees, washed up on the shores of Lake Erie just east of Britnail. Cuyahoga County Coroner A.J. Pierce noted some sort of chemical preservative on the skin which had turned it red, tough and leathery. 
The subsequent search yielded only a few other body parts. The body was that of a female in her mid-30s. The head was never found. The woman was never identified. She is only referred to as the Lady of the Lake. It wasn't until two years later that this find was included in the official killing total, and thus became known as victim number zero. It would be another year before the case began officially, and then it would be in another part of the city the now infamous Kingsbury Run. September 1935, two teenage boys discover the decapitated, emasculated corpse of a white male at the base of Jackass Hill, where East 49th Street dead ends into Kingsbury Run. The body, naked save for a pair of socks, was clean and drained of blood. There were rope burns around both wrists. Coroner Pierce determined the cause of death had been decapitation. Fingerprints identified this victim as Edward Andersey, a 28-year-old white male. Andersey had an arrest record, was rumored to be a homosexual, and frequented the Roaring Third. Police discovered a second body nearby, also decapitated and emasculated. It appeared to be covered with the same chemical preservative as the Lady of the Lake. This body apparently had been dead for at least a couple of weeks. The 40-year-old white male was never identified. January 1936, a woman discovers about half the body of a female neatly wrapped in newspaper, and packed in two half-bushel baskets. The baskets were left alongside the Hart Manufacturing Building on Central Avenue near East 20th Street. Everything except the head was recovered about 10 days later, in a vacant lot on nearby Orange Avenue. As in the case of Edward Andersey, the cause of death had been decapitation. For some reason, however, the killer had waited for rigor mortis to set in before disarticulating the rest of the body. Fingerprints again would allow the identification of one Florence Palillo, waitress, barmaid and prostitute. At the time of her death she resided at East 32nd Street and Carnegie, right on the edge of the Roaring Third. June 1936, early one morning in Kingsbury Run, two young boys discovered the head of a white male wrapped in a pair of trousers close to the East 55th Street Bridge. Police found the body of the 20-some-year-old man the next day, dumped in front of the Nickel Plate Railroad Police Building. Clean and drained of blood, the corpse was intact except for the head. Pierce again determined the death had been caused by decapitation. In spite of a fresh set of fingerprints, and the presence of six distinctive tattoos on various parts of the body, police were never able to identify the victim. A plaster reproduction of the man's head, along with a diagram of the kind and location of the tattoos, were made to display at the Great Lakes Exposition of 1936. More than 100,000 people saw the death mask and tattoo chart. The tattooed man was never identified. The original death mask, along with three others from the case are on display at the Cleveland Police Museum. July 1936, a teenage girl came across the decapitated remains of a 40-year-old white male, while walking through the woods near Clinton Road, and Big Creek on the near west side. The victim had been dead about two months and his head, as well as a pile of bloody clothing, was found nearby. Judging by the enormous quantity of blood that had seeped into the ground, this man had apparently been killed where his body was found. September 1936, a transient trips over the upper half of a man's torso, while trying to hop a train at East 37th Street in Kingsbury Run. Police searched a nearby pool, which was nothing more than a big open sewer, and found the lower half of the torso and parts of both legs. Police sent a diver in to make the recovery. The number of onlookers that turned out to watch, the grim spectacle was estimated at over 600, and the killer may well have been among them. Victim number 6 was in his late 20s and the cause of death, yet again, was decapitation. Coroner Pierce noted that the lack of hesitation marks in the disarticulation of the body indicated a strong, confident killer, very familiar with the human anatomy. The head had been cut off with one bold, clean stroke. The victim died instantly. Identification was never made. Six brutal killings in one year, and the police had neither clues nor suspects. The Cleveland Press, the Cleveland News and the Cleveland Plain Dealer, all reported almost daily on the killings and the lack of a suspect. Tension was high. Who was the mad butcher of Kingsbury Run? Giving in to mounting pressure from Mayor Harold Burton, recently appointed safety director Elliot Ness gets more involved in the case. Coroner Pierce calls for what the newspapers dub a torso clinic, a meeting of police, the coroner and other experts to discuss information and to profile someone, 
who could be responsible for these gruesome killings. The police department put detectives Peter Mirailo and Martin Zulski on the case full-time. They moved deftly through the seedy underworld that constitutes the run and the roaring third, often dressing the part, often on their own time. By the time the case had run its course, the two had interviewed more than 1,500 people, the department as a whole more than 5,000. This would be the biggest police investigation in Cleveland history. The November elections return Harold Burton as mayor, but Coroner Pierce is replaced by the young Democrat, and now legendary, Sam Gerber. Gerber's fierce dedication to medicine, along with his degree in law, put him at the forefront of the investigation. February 1937, a man finds the upper half of a woman's torso washed up on shore east of Broughtnail. Unlike all previous victims, the cause of death had not been decapitation, this had happened after she was already dead. The lower half of the torso washed ashore three months later at about East 30th Street. The woman was in her mid-twenties. She was never identified. June 1937, a teenage boy discovered a human skull under the Lorraine Carnegie Bridge. Next to it was a burlap bag containing the skeletal remains of what turned out to be a petite black woman about 40 years old. Dental work allowed for the unofficial identification of one Rose Wallace of Scoville Avenue. Police followed every lead they had on her, they led nowhere. July 1937, there were labor problems in the flats that summer, and the National Guard had been called in to maintain order. A young guardsman standing watch by the West 3rd Street Bridge, saw the first piece of victim number 9 in the wake of a passing tugboat. Over the next few days, police recovered the entire body, except for the head, from the waters of the Cuyahoga River. The abdomen had been gutted and the heart ripped out, clearly indicating a new element of viciousness in the killer's approach. The victim was in his mid to late thirties, he was never identified. April 1938, a young laborer on his way to work in the flat saw, what he at first thought was a dead fish, along the banks of the Cuyahoga River. Closer inspection revealed it to be the lower half of a woman's leg, the first piece of victim number 10. A month later police pulled two burlap bags out of the river containing both parts of the torso and most of the rest of both legs. For the first time coroner Gerber detected drugs in the system. Were the drugs used to immobilize the victim or was she an addict? The answer might come when they found the arms, they never did. She was never identified. August 16, 1938, three scrap collectors foraging in a dump site at East 9th and Lakeside found the torso of a woman wrapped in a man's double-breasted blue blazer, and then wrapped again in an old quilt. The legs and arms were discovered in a recently constructed makeshift box, wrapped in brown butcher paper and held together with rubber bands. The head had been similarly wrapped. Gerber noted that some of the parts looked as if they had been refrigerated. While searching for more pieces, the police discovered the remains of a second body only yards away. These two bodies had been placed in a location that was in plain view from Elliot Ness's office window, almost as if taunting him. Both victims number 11 and number 12 were never identified. August 18, 1938, at 12.40 a.m., Elliot Ness and a group of 35 police officers and detectives raid the hobo jungles of the run. Eleven squad cars, two police vans and three fire trucks descend on the largest cluster of makeshift shacks where the Cuyahoga River twists behind Public Square. Ness's raiders worked their way south through the run eventually gathering up 63 men. At dawn, police and firemen searched the deserted shanties for clues. Then, on orders from safety director Ness, the shacks were set on fire and burned to the ground. The press severely criticized Ness for his actions. The public was afraid and frustrated. Critics said the raid would do nothing to solve the murders. They were right but for whatever reason, they did stop. July 1939, County Sheriff Martin O'Donnell arrested 52-year-old, Bohemian bricklayer Frank de Lazau for the murder of Flo Polillo. De Lazau had lived with her for a while, and subsequent investigation revealed he had been acquainted with Edward Andersey and Rose Wallace. His confession turned out to be a bewildering blend of incoherent tremblings and neat, precise details, almost as if he had been coached. Before he could go to trial, Delezal was found dead in his cell. The five-foot Delezal had hanged himself from a hook only five feet seven inches off the floor. Gerber's autopsy revealed six broken ribs, all of which had been obtained while in the sheriff's custody. 
To this day no one thinks Frank Delazal was the torso killer. The question is, why did Sheriff O'Donnell? The Kingsbury Run murders remain one of the most perplexing cases in our nation's criminal history. Rumors abound as to who may have been the killer. One thing is very clear, Elliot Miss had a suspect who he believed was undoubtedly the killer. This suspect continued to taunt Ness for years after the killings had stopped. All official police records on this case have been lost, destroyed, or removed. 7. Sherry Melissa Early. Early had a part-time job delivering pizzas for a Domino's Pizza franchise in Salem, Oregon in 1982. She had just graduated from Sprague High School, and was living with a cousin in an apartment in South Salem. She was called into work in on July 4, 1982. Eardley left work at 9.30 p.m. that day to deliver a pizza to an address on River Haven Drive South, near Brown Island Road, in a remote area of Salem. She has never been heard from again. Eardley's pizza delivery van was found abandoned later that evening. The parking brake was set, the door was open, three large boxes of pizza lay on the ground, and Eardley's hat lay nearby. There was no sign of a struggle, however. Police determined that the address Early was supposed to go to was fictitious. The person who called in the delivery had also given a false name. The call had been placed from a hotel in Salem. The day after Early's disappearance, someone placed a call to the Domino's Pizza where she worked, demanding a ransom for her safe return. The caller did not communicate with them again, however, and nobody ever attempted to collect any money. Daryl J. Wilson was classified as a suspect in Yearly's case for many years. He committed suicide a month after her disappearance, just hours after being questioned by police about it. He had at first denied knowing Yearly but later admitted being acquainted with her. He drove a lime green pickup truck similar to a vehicle, that was seen near the site of Yearly's disappearance shortly, before she vanished. After her disappearance, Wilson painted the truck brown. Wilson was camping at Elkhorn Lake, 34 miles east of Salem, the night he early disappeared, but he was gone from the campsite, between 6.30 p.m. on July 4 and 3.30 a.m. on July 5. Authorities searched his vehicle for physical evidence connecting him to Early's case but found nothing. Later events convinced police he was not involved in her disappearance. In December 2007, Authorities announced William Scott Smith had pleaded guilty to murder in Yearly's case. A photograph of Smith is posted below this case summary. He is already serving two life terms in prison for the abduction, rape and strangulation murders of two Salem women. His guilty plea in Yearly's presumed death means another life sentence will be added. He said he and an accomplice, Roger Nose, had planned to abduct another female Domino's pizza worker and hold her for ransom but the woman was not working that night and they kidnapped Early instead. He stated he strangled her to death afterwards. Smith said it was Nosef who made the ransom call to Domino's. Nosef died of cancer in 2003, and was never charged in Early's case. Smith said he dumped Early's body the Pudding River, which is also where he placed the remains of his other two victims. Searches of the area turned up nothing, but the Pudding River has flooded many times since 1982, and any evidence may have been lost. Eardley's body has never been located, but foul play is suspected in her case due to the circumstances involved. 8. The Blind River Killer On the morning of June 28, 1991, Gord and Jackie McAllister of Lindsay, Ontario, Canada, were the only two people in the Blind River, Ontario rest stop. At 12.55 a.m., they were sleeping peacefully, when a man identifying himself as a police officer woke them, by pounding on their window. He told them they needed to move their RV. When Jackie opened the door, the man barged in and demanded money and valuables. He was armed with a 22 caliber rifle and a 20 gauge shotgun. As Jackie went through her purse, the gunman shot her. Gord was also shot, but he managed to jump out of the vehicle, I rolled underneath the motor home and I noticed that another car had driven into the rest area. And this guy had got out and was standing beside the car. 29-year-old Brian Major got back in his car, but there was no escape. The gunman shot him, too, then ran off, and I was lying there, just praying to God that he'd keep on running, and he did. Soon as he went by I rolled back out and got up, into our motorhome, and drove out onto the highway. 
I knew I had to get out onto the highway to get some help. Gordy flagged down a trucker, but it was too late. Gord's wife, Jackie, was already dead. The gunman's other victim, Ryan Major, also died at the scene. He left behind a wife and a young son. Gord's injuries were minor. When Ontario Papers published a drawing of the gunman based on Gord's description, a witness came forward. He said that a few minutes after 1 a.m. on the night of the murders, a blue van peeled out of the Blind River rest stop and headed straight toward his car. The van continued dead east, toward Sudbury, Ontario. The witness didn't notice if it had Canadian or U.S. plates. Police checked out more than 3,500 blue vans on both sides of the border. But, according to Detective Inspector Frank Kreider of the Ontario Provincial Police, they found no matches. The fortunate situation here is that we do have a survivor. Gord McAllister survived his wounds, and hopefully, he can point out the killer someday. Gordon looked through hundreds of mug shots, but none jumped out. Then, the police turned to computer technology, hoping to improve on the original rough sketch of the killer. Gord helped work on a new drawing, I'll never forget his face. It wasn't a robbery gone badly. There was no resistance to this guy. He just simply was going to kill somebody. For no reason. Gord McAllister described his killer as tall, skinny man with long, stringy blonde hair. Although a killer has never been officially charged for the crimes, authorities believe the suspect to be Ronald Glenn West, a retired Blind River police officer in prison, for murdering two others in the 1970s.